Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second lecture of our Korean Reunification Academy series, titled Understanding North Korean Human Rights, Formation of the UN Commission of Inquiry, and organized by PSCO. My name is Kim Tae-hun, and I'm the president of PSCO. You are joined today by the Honorable Mr. Justice Michael Cobb, former chair of the United Nations Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. We hereafter will call Democratic People's Republic of Korea as North Korea. We will be discussing the state of North Korean human rights and how the UN Commission of Inquiry was responding to these issues. Mr. Cobb, it's great to have with us. How are you? Good, and I'm very glad to see you again. And I thank you for the help uh, that you uh, and your colleagues gave to the Commission of Inquiry. And I'm glad that through the miracle of Zoom, we can continue to have dialogue which is the foundation of human rights and human understanding. Thank you. Then I will ask some questions. First, maybe I'll give you short questions. Then you will give us very accurate and maybe at your self, uh, long answers. Uh, at any time. So <clears throat> first, could you briefly summarize the human rights situation in North Korea? Keep in mind that I have not been to North Korea because North Korea would not permit the Commission of Inquiry uh, to visit, even though the UN Human Rights Council urged the member countries to cooperate with the Commission. Keep in mind also that my work as chair of the uh, COI on North Korea has formally concluded uh, by the uh, presentation of our report. And this was the report and we gave the report to the Human Rights Council of the United Nations uh, in uh, February and March 2014. Uh, I do not now have a mandate uh, from the United Nations on uh, North Korean human rights. And therefore, uh, although my interest is still keen, uh, it is, not an official interest of the United Nations, which has a special rapporteur, uh, Mr. Thomas Quintana, uh, who is from Argentina. He is the mandate holder as the special rapporteur. But as with his predecessors, uh, the uh, government in North Korea uh, have not cooperated with him. Uh, they have not permitted him to visit that country. Um, according to uh, the best reports that I have seen, the situation of human rights in North Korea is still very much as it was described in the report of the Commission of Inquiry in 2014. Uh, there have been some minor improvements, uh, for example, in the treatment of people with physical and mental disabilities. Uh, there has been an improvement according to the reports on that score. And in fact, North Korea has permitted the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Disabilities to come to their country and to see the progress they have made in that 
respect. Uh, there is a field office of the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, that has been established in accordance with the recommendation of the Commission of Inquiry, and it has an office in Seoul in the Republic of Korea. It continues to gather information and testimony about the state of human rights in North Korea. There are still refugees who try to escape from North Korea to come to the Republic of Korea. In some centers, they are called um, defectors, but I prefer to call them refugees. And they continue to bring stories which are reported in uh, news media about the shocking conditions in North Korea. Uh, those conditions involve many breaches of human rights, uh, political rights, uh, cultural rights, uh, uh, economic rights, uh, and uh, civil uh, rights. Uh, those breaches uh, occur and are reported in the report of the Commission. Every country in the world has breaches of human rights. My own country, Australia, has breaches of human rights and has had them in the past in the way we dealt with our indigenous people, the Aboriginal people, uh, in the way we dealt with women, in the day way we dealt with people of different race, uh, and in the way we dealt with uh, LGBT people, gay people. So every country has human rights problems. But what was special about North Korea is that the Commission of Inquiry found that a number of the human rights abuses which it discovered in North Korea were uh, of a much higher order of magnitude. They were, as it is described in international law, crimes against humanity. Crimes uh, against humanity are uh, human rights abuses which shock the conscience of mankind. And those are the crimes which are most serious and they are recorded in the report of the COI. They include uh, the prison system and detention camps, which uh, extend all over North Korea in which people who are suspected uh, of being um, uh, hostile to the government of North Korea, uh, but also their families, their parents and their children are locked up uh, and punished by deprivation of liberties. Uh, there are no um, free uh, newspapers or media. Access to the internet is forbidden, except for people in the elite, the government of North Korea. Um, school children are forced to go to watch executions, public executions, which are very disturbing uh, and uh, shocking to the children and other people concerned. Um, and abductions of uh, people uh, has been regularly practiced by North Korea. Uh, most of the abductees are uh, Korean citizens, many Korean soldiers from South Korea were seized and abducted to North Korea. 
uh, and many citizens who were thought to be useful were abducted to North Korea uh, and have not been able to have uh, telephone or postal or other contact with their families. Uh, as well, uh, North Korea has seized a number of foreigners, particularly Japanese nationals, and uh, it has uh, prevented them from going back to their homeland in Japan. Uh, so uh, crimes against humanity are shocking, uh, and uh, these are some of the crimes against humanity, and they're all set out in this report. You can get a copy of this report, and I think you even arrange for this report to be translated into the Korean language, but you cannot get this report in North Korea. And I uh, said to the government of North Korea, that if they let the COI come into North Korea and they could establish that we had made any mistakes in our report, uh, we would publicly correct those mistakes uh, and correct our report. But uh, they didn't allow us to come in and that has remained the same to the present day in respect of Mr. Quintana, the special rapporteur on North Korea. If they have nothing to be afraid of, they should allow the representatives of the United Nations to enter uh, and uh, to report. If they don't want to let the United Nations, they should nominate respected professors or people who could come and look and report on their country from neutral, independent uh, countries uh, with high integrity, but they haven't done that. So this is the state at the time we reported in 2014, and I believe it is still substantially uh, the way things are in North Korea. And anybody who wants to see uh, the situation of human rights in North Korea should Google uh, United Nations Commission of Inquiry on North Korea and look at the testimony, the evidence that we receive because it is all there on the internet. And in the Republic of Korea, you can have free access to it. In the Democratic People's Republic, North Korea, you cannot have access to it without suffering very severe punishment. All right, thank you. It's very impressive, the, especially the crimes against humanity. Uh, there are North Korean uh, human rights abuse amount to uh, crimes against humanity. Then, what's the significance of the formation of the UN Commission of Inquiry on human rights in North Korea? What's the significance then? I think the significance was that the international community had been receiving reports over many years, decades, about um, abuses of human rights in North Korea. Uh, and eventually, uh, in 2013, uh, the decision was made by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations to go beyond having a special rapporteur uh, and to establish a commission of inquiry. A commission of inquiry is a step up in the scrutiny of human rights abuses. It generally happens only when the world community is deeply concerned about the situation of human rights. And so that is why uh, it was established. Uh, and uh, it was established 
uh, without any votes against establishing it. That is very unusual. That has never happened before or since. Usually, some countries will vote against it because they are afraid that if commissions of inquiry are established, there will be much more um, scrutiny and much more attention in the media. Uh, and they're afraid that that might come back uh, to them and therefore they vote against it. But in the case of North Korea, the situation uh, was so serious and uh, had been so for so long that no country voted against the establishment of the Commission of Inquiry. The president of the Human Rights Council, who was the ambassador from Poland, uh, which itself had at one stage been a communist country, uh, he called for any votes against, any votes against, and there were no votes against. So the Commission of Inquiry uniquely was established by uh, the unanimous vote of the Human Rights Council. And that is how I came to be appointed to be the chair of the Commission of Inquiry. I did not have any um, animosity to North Korea. I had no a hatred of North Korea. I was not an expert on North Korea. I approached the issue of North Korea with an open mind because I had been a judge in my own country for 34 years. And that was what I did when I received the mandate. And uh, I can say that I was shocked by the testimony that we received. And uh, so were my two colleagues, Marzuki Darasman, the former Attorney General of Indonesia, and Sonia Biserko, um, a well-known uh, expert uh, on uh, crimes against humanity from Serbia in Europe. So we three were the three members of the Commission of Inquiry. And the significance lies in the fact that North Korea had not been cooperating. Uh, Mr. Durrisman therefore recommended a step up by creating a more rigorous and public procedure, which is the Commission of Inquiry. And this was adopted without any negative vote by the Human Rights Council of the whole world in the United Nations. Yes, it was really 2014 CY report was the epoch making history uh, event. So then what do you think is the gravest human rights abuse in the DPRK. When I was sitting on the Commission of Inquiry, we decided uh, unusually to have public hearings. Public hearings are the way English speaking people conduct inquiries, uh, whether from the United Kingdom or from Australia and New Zealand or from parts of Africa uh, or Asia. Uh, that's the way we do inquiries. Um, and I felt uh, when I was sitting in the inquiry and hearing the testimony, that it seemed very similar to the black and white newsreels of the time after the Second World War when there were commissions of inquiry and war crimes trials conducted uh, against uh, the fascist um, dictators and their officials. Uh, 
And so, um, although I had been a judge in Australia for 34 years, and in that time I had heard many serious and horrible crimes, I had never heard anything like the testimony that I uh, had to listen to in respect of North Korea. And if you are surprised by that, then you should Google the COI and look yourself, because that is something you can do. In North Korea, they cannot do that. But in the Republic of Korea and in Australia and in the rest of the world, anybody who is interested can look at the witnesses and reach a conclusion on whether they believe the witnesses or whether they think that they are exaggerating or telling lies. Mm -hmm. I believe anybody who witches, looks at the witnesses uh, will be shocked uh, and will come to the conclusion that uh, action is necessary. The most serious crimes that we heard about were the crimes of detention of so many people. Some people have said that it's probably a million people detained in the detention camps in North Korea. We did not think it was a million. We thought it was more likely to be about 150,000, but that's still a lot of people. And it's people who are themselves suspected, but also their parents and their children, because they are looked on like a cancer in the society that has to be isolated and kept apart. And the stories of uh, the malnutrition, the lack of food, the lack of uh, engagement with families uh, is, uh, were terrible. And the treatment of women and the treatment of political prisoners uh, was shocking especially the treatment of women who were returned uh, by China to North Korea and the way they were treated, as particularly if they had uh, uh, become pregnant and had a child, a baby, uh, they were treated and punished because uh, we found that in North Korea, there's quite a lot of racism. Uh, racism is not only against black lives that matter. Racism exists in many countries. Racism has existed in my own country, Australia, when we had the white Australia policy and when we treated the Aboriginal people very unfairly. Well, racism exists in North Korea against people, uh, especially women who marry or form relationships with Han Chinese. And that is another basis of punishment uh, of such people. So there are many terrible crimes which are revealed in the reports they are in our report of the COI, but they're also on the internet with the testimony of the witnesses. They're still there on the internet. And uh, I challenge North Korea to permit the internet uh, testimony to be broadcast in North Korea uh, and to give answers to the testimony of the people, most of them Korean nationals uh, who have been suffering in the detention camps. Mazuki Darisman used to say, we cannot deal with all of the problems, but we should focus on the detention camps. We should try to reduce the uh, detention of so many people in the detention camps. 
However, unfortunately, uh, we have not achieved any improvement in that respect. Another matter that certainly is barbarous is the refusal to allow people from South Korea to meet family members in North Korea. This is particularly cruel because such people separated by the Korean War are now becoming quite old. And unless reunion becomes possible in the immediate future, they will lose that opportunity to meet divided families. And instead of permitting uh, dialogue such as we are having now, let it be by Zoom. Uh, they don't permit that. What you and I are doing from Korea to Australia and Australia to Korea would be a perfect way to let families meet each other by, uh, by uh, webinar process, but they don't permit that. That is a shocking abuse of fundamental human rights and that should be changed and quickly. Yeah, you gave us so many kinds of human rights violations in North Korea. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, one of the uh, human rights abuse in North Korea. According to the findings of the CY report, how is the situation regarding the flow of information both within North Korea and across the border? We received quite a lot of testimony on that and it is summarized in our report. Uh, uh, in North Korea, there is not free access to the flow of information that we take for granted in countries uh, like uh, South Korea or Australia. Uh, there is no free access to the internet there are no free newspapers. Uh, uh, television stations are politically controlled. Uh, and uh, therefore, the flow of information is very poor. Uh, and uh, this needs to be changed. But how can it be changed if the government demands total control of the flow of information? This is uh, rather similar to the Nazis and to Stalinist dictatorship in the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, it controls the minds of people because they cannot get other points of view. And uh, that uh, is contrary to fundamental human rights. Um, some steps have been taken. For example, um, the Voice of America um, has improved uh, the um, broadcasting uh, to get into uh, radios available in North Korea. Um, I believe that some um, internet active um, receivers have been ballooned into North Korea. I also believe that uh, people on the free market in North Korea can sometimes acquire, um, maybe on a visit to China, uh, the um, internet uh, receptive uh, mobile phones and other devices. So uh, then becomes the problem of Wi-Fi. But I understand that if they go near uh, international hotels or near um, embassies, they can sometimes use their uh, mobile device to pick up the signal and to get access 
uh, to international news and opinion, and also uh, sometimes to their relatives. Uh, but there is an urgent need to improve the flow of information because information makes us free. Information gives us uh, an opportunity to judge the truth ourselves as citizens. And this is what uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, provides. And it is what North Korea denies to its citizens. Um, I hope that the Republic of Korea will find some way consistent with its own constitution uh, and the principle of free expression uh, in South Korea to provide access in North Korea to the report of the Commission of Inquiry. No use making long reports if it goes into a, the waste paper basket and is not available to the people to whom it is addressed. Because when you make it available, then the people will begin to demand answers and they will see that their suffering uh, is wrong and should be corrected. Before I undertook the task on North Korea, back in the 1990s, I was appointed by the United Nations as special representative of the Secretary General on Cambodia. This was at a time just after the fall of the Khmer Rouge regime. And that, uh, that change uh, meant that we could confront um, those who had committed abuses of human rights and crimes against humanity and they were required to answer. Transparency and accountability are important aspects of human rights. If you don't let people know what the world has discovered, then no one will make demand that things should improve. And that's why it is important that the people of North Korea should get this report. They joined the United Nations. DPRK is a member of the United Nations and yeah. they didn't have to join the United Nations, but they did join. They joined on the same day as the Republic of Korea joined mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and they have not cooperated in any way with the uh, COI or the special rapporteurs, and they have they have withheld the information in our report from the people of North Korea, which is not acceptable. Thank you. Then maybe what needs to be done in order to improve the human rights situation in the DPRK? Is there anything? especially you would like to say to young people to improve? Well, <clears throat> young people are the hope of the world. Uh, I am now coming towards the end of my life, but they have the whole future ahead of them. Mm -hmm. And young people uh, share a knowledge about the struggle of the United Nations uh, to uphold human rights. The creation after the Second World War because of the shocking discoveries that happened uh, in 1945, uh, the United Nations was set up and one of the three pillars of the United Nations was universal human rights. And young people know this in uh, countries uh, like the Republic of Korea and Australia. And if they don't know it, they can be told about it by people like you and people like me. And they can expect 
that their leaders will comply with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so uh, I think young people should make themselves familiar with the report on North Korea. Uh, I often said we should have a version of our report uh, which is uh, in comic form, like a comic book uh, that makes it simple for people to understand. We included in our report a, a cartoon of the treatment that happened in the prisons in North Korea, where uh, people were detained and tortured. Uh, and we included the cartoon drawn by uh, one of the detainees who escaped. And he drew uh, uh, representations, cartoons of how he was treated. And I think it would be a good thing if we had a simplified version that spoke very simply to people and showed in Korean, in the Korean language, uh, what uh, the report reveals. Actually, I think this report is very easy to read. And that is because it isn't just dense text of lawyers. Every page has quote from the testimony of witnesses about the subject that the report is dealing with. And we find in English speaking countries, this is why we do inquiries in public and with witnesses, because a person who has suffered wrong can express that wrong very vividly and can express it very briefly. And that's why every page or every second page has the testimony of somebody who has described not just what happens generally, but what happened to them. And that's why uh, I hope uh, it becomes more available in South Korea and is also made available uh, to citizens in North Korea. The BBC has resumed uh, Korean language broadcasts. And uh, I hope that that is another means by which information can be spread to the people of North Korea. So uh, these are steps that need to be taken and uh, they must be supported by the citizens of the Republic of Korea because it is their, their uncles, aunts, uh, family who are suffering. And that's why I think it's very important. I understand the feeling on both sides of politics in South Korea, both sides of politics have made this plan. The um, feeling of distress uh, caused by the separation of the two parts of Korea, that was never decided by the Korean people. It was never decided in a plebiscite or referendum it was forced on the people of the Korean Peninsula by the allied leaders, Stalin, Churchill, Roosevelt. They decided to divide the Korean Peninsula. This is not a division by the people of Korea. And it's therefore uh, important that we find a way to solve the division, but also to stand strong 
for universal human rights, particularly those human rights which constitute crimes against humanity. Okay. Uh, there are many participants in this lecture, so some of our participants have questions for you, Mr. Carvey. So we we'll open the floor to them now. Participants, please raise your hand using the Zoom hand raising feature. Even though we don't have much time, but please go on. Anybody? Any participants? Oh, Sandra. Okay, we have a question from Sandra. Um, thank you very much for answering your questions. So what would you say has so far been the most successful measure that the UN has taken concerning human rights in North Korea? I think uh, the recommendation uh, that we made that uh, there should be opened a field office in, in uh, outside North Korea, which could receive the testimony, the continuing testimony of people who had escaped from North Korea. Uh, that uh, was recommended and it was uh, accepted by the Human Rights Council and it was led to the establishment of the uh, United Nations Human Rights Office in Seoul. I have visited that office uh, since the report of the commission was written. And uh, I think that is a very good result. Uh, another good result is that since the report was written, North Korea has begun to um, uh, engaged, engage with the Human Rights Council in universal periodic review. This is the system in the United Nations, uh, separate from commissions of inquiry or the special rapporteurs, for every country to go through a rotation uh, to answer concerns that have been expressed by other countries or by UN bodies. And uh, North Korea initially said there were no human rights violations at all. But then when they began to receive um, complaints of human rights from the United Nations system, they eventually agreed uh, to um, undertake universal periodic review. And in some cases, though not all, they agreed to the recommendation that the United Nations had proposed. So step by step, this can be done. In our report, we suggested a lot of little steps. For example, opening postal services between North Korea and South Korea, uh, or opening telephone uh, services, or uh, permitting links such as we are now having, uh, uh, sporting uh, contacts. There have been some sporting contacts in connection with the Olympic Games. So these are steps in the right direction, but they are happening very slowly. And uh, as I said earlier, the family reunions are a very urgent requirement because of the fact that people are getting old. Uh, and it should not be decided by a lottery or a ballot that is really uncivilized to do that to other people. And it should be by a ready system, letting people speak to each other, uh, if necessary, not 
person to person, but at least by a Zoom link. If it can happen with us, it should happen between families in Korea. Thank you. Then also we have another question from Charlotte. Please, Charlotte. Yeah. So I have a question regarding the reunification. So one of the goals of Peace Corps, the NGO most of today's audience is working for, is the reunification of North and South Korea. So my question is, in your opinion, do you think today the idea of unification is still realistic? And also, do you think the reunification is a mandatory step in order for North Korea to eventually become a developed country? Or do you think this would also be possible without reunification? I do think uh, reunification is a step that will happen. Um, Professor Victor Cha, who worked in the White House for uh, uh, President George W. Bush, has written a book on this issue And at the last chapter of his book, he says, if in 20 years, uh, North and South Korea are united, I will not be surprised. Full stop, period. Mm -hmm. If in 20 years, North Korea and South Korea are not reunited, I will not be surprised. So we, we don't know what will happen, but other countries which were arbitrarily divided by um, former military enemies subsequently have achieved reunification. Germany is a well-known example, uh, but another example is Austria. Uh, which was divided after the uh, Second World War. Uh, the forces of language, culture, uh, and memories are very powerful forces to reinforce the moves to reunite. And it won't happen easily so long as North Korea continues to keep Uh, its own people unaware of what the rest of the world is like. If you, if you tell uh, your own people that the world is made up of brutal uh, regimes that mean to destroy the uh, glorious um, uh, regime of North Korea, then people will be afraid. But if ordinary citizens can get access to um, the truth of what life is like in South Korea and in North Korea, then things can be improved. This is why um, soap operas from South Korea are so popular in North Korea. They're popular because they are uh, including people not with dubbing uh, of putting foreign languages into the mouths of people, but allowing people to hear their uh, relatives, their cousins, their families speaking Korean. But it is very um, dangerous Uh, in the view of some of the leaders of North Korea, because in the background are the white goods, the washing machines, the television sets, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, modern technology of information, uh, uh, the tape recordings, the, um, uh, the internet, all of these modern devices can be seen in life in the Republic of Korea. And that uh, tends to deny what is 
often said to people in North Korea that the people in, uh, in, in South Korea are prisoners. They are imprisoned by their own society. So it's important to break down this ignorance and non-communication and to find ways to open dialogue. Uh, President Trump tried to open dialogue. And when he did that, uh, I must say, I thought that was a much better strategy than his first statement in the United Nations where he called the president of or the, the um, uh, supreme leader, uh, now the uh, general secretary of the Korean Workers' Party, Kim Jong-un, he called him little rocket man, insulted him and said he would lay North Korea waste uh, if he keeps up this uh, strategy. But in fact, a much better approach is dialogue and outreach. Uh, but um, unfortunately, he didn't really go about it the right way. The right way to go about dialogue is not to leap straight into the most difficult issue of all, which is probably the nuclear weapons. What you have to do, you have to start on the periphery. You've got to start with achievable goals. You've got to start with opening um, postal services, with allowing sporting context, contests, with allowing uh, sister city contacts, with permitting television for half an hour every day. Uh, you've got to start with little steps. And above all, I hope, start with family reunions, because that is really urgent. Uh, and they families should not be held hostages uh, to um, gain political points. So I think things can be done, but it has to be little step by little step, not just jumping straight into the really hard issues. Uh, and it can't be done ignoring human rights. If you say that's not on the table, then you're never going to have peace on the Korean Peninsula because it's going to be necessary to deal with the issues that are recorded in our report and that is before the international community. These have to be answered. And how that is done will depend upon the Biden administration and the new Secretary General of the uh, Workers' Party of Korea, Kim Jong-un, uh, and the elected president of the Republic of Korea, Moon Jae-in. Uh, they are the most important participants, but President Xi and President Putin are also very important. And I understand both President Xi of China and President Putin of the Russian Federation have indicated that they will be visiting uh, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, in the next six months. And that might provide with the new Biden administration an opportunity to look for the little steps that can begin a genuine dialogue uh, between the people of Korea. They are still the Korean people. They are still your family. And that is why there is a good starting point, but it has to be uh, built upon and pressed forward. And it has to be on the basis of improving the human rights record. Thank you. It's a very important questions you have and your explanation is very clear and very important. Yeah, time is almost, but yeah, last questions. Uh, we have a question from Noah. 
โอเคก็ Thank you for answering the questions um, How can we ensure that more witnesses come forth with the testimonies Many of them fear that their families will be in danger We uh, were very respectful of that fear when we um, made contact with uh, the Korean community from North Korea in the South, uh, and we advertised uh, for people to come forward. If they did not want to reveal themselves, we saw them privately. If they were afraid. We saw them privately, and I believe that that is still done by the United Nations office in Seoul. But many of them said, "No, I don't want to be private. I want to speak up." Uh, and in fact, looking back, even though we were not able to achieve a lot of our goals in North Korea, we helped people speak. Truth to power, and that is a very important thing. We allowed people who had escaped from North Korea to speak through us to the Secretary General of the United Nations, to the Human Rights Council, to the General Assembly, and even to the Security Council of the United Nations, because our report was placed on the. Agenda of the Security Council, and these were steps uh, that we were able to take, and uh, I think that can still be done. But I believe, Noah, that you will find a lot of people who have escaped from North Korea don't want to be secret. They do want to speak up. They do feel an obligation as human beings. They do feel a duty to their long-lost families. They do feel a duty to the world community. They feel a duty even to people in strange countries like Australia, or New Zealand, or Guatemala, or um, Azerbaijan. We are all one on this planet. And this is the amazing thing that in my lifetime uh, we have had human beings who have gone on to the moon and have sent vehicles out into far distant, uh, unimaginable areas of space, and then look back at our planet. It is. Uniquely beautiful, it is a small blue planet, and we are all together, and we're all here. But we could destroy everything if we don't address uh, nuclear weapons, climate change, universal human rights, and that's why this is an urgent matter. And it's why I feel an obligation to speak up. I believe that President Moon Jae-in uh, worked for many years for President Kim Dae-jung. I met President Kim Dae-jung. He came to Australia just before he was elected president of the Republic of Korea. He was a very great man, and when I came to Seoul, I would go to his c e n t e r which is based in uh, Seoul, and his widow received me, and I paid my respects to her. He, she was a very great woman, and so I believe that President Moon Jae-in. Is himself a human rights lawyer, and he is worried about how to get progress. And I understand that, but you will not make progress if you don't address the problems of human rights that are recorded in this report. 
what if we had known in the 1930s about the murder of Jews and other minorities in Hitler's Germany? What if we had turned away and done nothing about it? It would only impede getting progress. It's necessary to address our problems. And we should keep in mind our small blue planet. We are all together here. And young people who are the guardians of the future must speak up for human rights as the foundation of peace and security. Without human rights, there will not be stable peace and security, especially in the age of nuclear weapons. Thank you. It's almost running out. It's amazing. Uh, you are so happy. This opportunity with you, even you are from, you are Australia and you are Korean Peninsula. Oh, thank you again. So this concludes our discussion with Honorable Mr. Just Kobe. Thank you again so much for your contribution to our lecture series and your thoughtful insights on this topic. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you very much, Kim Kai Hun, and my respects to the people of the Republic of Korea and my respects to the people of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Together, we can make a change. Yes, I am looking forward to seeing you again, maybe after this pandemic. Yes, after COVID-19, uh, I will be there many times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Mm -hmm.